how many of you are out of your minds? Well, if you're not now, hopefully you will be at the end of my talk. Um, three weeks ago, I had my bag stolen on one of those trains from London to uh, Brighton. Broad daylight, very crafty way they did it. Everything, my laptop, my iPhone, my keys, my credit cards, my money, my list of passwords, which I know I shouldn't carry around with me, my <laughs> file facts. I was gutted. Anyway, eventually I got home uh, about an hour and a half later, and then one of the first things I did was, as you're supposed to, is to ring up all your banks to stop your cards and then ring up the phone company. So the first one I rang up was First Direct. Any of you bank with First Direct? They still have human beings who answer the phone. So that was good. So they say... Um, Password, uh, what's your postcode? I was able to do that, but I was very stressed because I didn't know how many hundreds, thousands of pounds that the, these guys had used my cards for. And um, then they asked me uh, my surname and initials, and then they always say, Dr. Rogers, could you give us the second letter of your password? That's fine. Let's imagine my password is balsamic, A. Then they say, and the six. And I go... Six, what is it? I don't know how many of you are on it, but I have to go B, A, L, S, A, M. And I go, yes, and the seventh. And you have to start all over again. We have to, I have to count using my fingers because I can't imagine what the sixth letter is. I don't know how many else of you have that or whether you can just go through that. But many um, activities involve us using our fingers and moving pieces around in order to try and remember things or to get um, um, to extend the way we think so here is a very uh, common um, practice of playing scrabble where you have your uh, tiles in that um, little container and when you when you haven't got any vowels it's really really hard to try and make up a word you might have a y and so you're desperately moving them around but that activity of moving the pieces um, and shuffling them is an important part of thinking. The same way when we're playing with cards, some of us may move the cards around in our hand to try and think about the, the moves we're going to make and what suits. And, and uh, those of you who play poker, I'm sure you've got various strategies as well. Tetris is another game that's um, very popular um, and has been written about quite a lot in terms of how we move the pieces, rotate them before we actually try and insert them to get the best uh, possible positioning of those pieces. And um, the same when we are playing chess, we'll hold a piece and we'll move it around like this to see how the other player might, uh, what moves they might make as a counter move, and we hold on to it and, and project out there. Now, how many of you were at um, the talk, the conference last year, and saw Carl Fast? I think that was his name. He talked about um, deeper interaction, and he mentioned some of these um, kinds of physical interactions that we have with objects um, in the environment um, as a way of thinking about how our mind is coupled with the artefacts and, and, and the environment. And it's very central to, to how we think. And he talked about not just playing games, but also in the world of work, we use stick it, stick it, stickies, post-it notes, and we sketch and we draw and we have uh, bits of paper. And a lot of... Um, um, our work involves using um, and projecting our ideas out there. And what I want to do today is to, is to build um, upon these ideas of uh, what's often called um, external cognition and embodied um, cognition or embodied interaction and think about what, um, what, this, what role this has, this understanding of how we think with our bodies for the future of UX. I think all of you are probably experts at doing um, interface design, especially in web design, and I have very little to say um, that you don't know already. But I think if we're thinking in the future where we're talking about the Internet of Things, we're talking about um, out there, putting devices out there, we're talking about coupling devices in all sorts of interesting ways, then we should think a, a bit about how we interact with the environment and how we project our um, ideas and how we think with our bodies. And that might change the way in which we think about interactivity and design in profound ways. There are lots of people um, who've written about um, extended mind, external cognition, embodied interaction. And we heard earlier uh, one of those um, from MC mentioning one of my uh, 
uh, colleagues, um, Paul Durish, who's written a very important book called um, Where the Action Is. Where's the Action Is? I can't see much out there. Um, but um, I think these three people have, uh, who are cognitive scientists and philosophers have, have written very profoundly about this whole idea of um, um, embodiment. And in contrast to the prevailing um, paradigm in cognitive science, we should think very much about modeling what goes on in the mind. And they all um, talk about this. This is David Kirsch here on the left, who is um, a cognitive scientist in UCSD. Alva Noe, I'm not sure where he is at the moment. And Andy Clark, who used to be a professor of philosophy here in Sussex, but is now at Edinburgh. And they all talk about how we think with our bodies, not just our brains. So at the moment, my leg's probably thinking a bit, and my arm might be doing some more. Um, and they talk um, about how tools change the way we think and perceive the world. And tools, um, they can be like this, get absorbed into our body schemas, <coughs> such that we may find it difficult to know uh, what the boundary is. So there's a classic example many of you may know about the blind person with the stick as they're walking along. Where is the boundary for that person? Is it here where um, the hand is, where it joins it, or is it here where the tip is? And the argument is, for the blind person, it's there. It, so this um, stick extends their body schema to where they actually feel it on the, on the, on the, um, on the floor. And um, there are other ways in which uh, our objects change our body schema. How many of you drive small cars like minis and Hondas? And how many of you drive SUVs, those really big um, cars? Well, that, there's one or two of you admitting to it down there. When you sit in an SUV, your whole perception of the world changes. Does it not? It makes you feel you're on top of the world and you are invincible and you, um, you don't have the same fear of, of other drivers. Any of you have seen uh, the school run when you see um, mothers and fathers driving their kids to school in these SUVs, um, they are fearless. Um, it's not just about driving uh, a car, but also the kinds of shoes you wear. We saw uh, red heels and we also saw Dr. Martens, and that changes the way in which you um, um, uh, interact with the world, but also how you feel, whether you're towering over someone or whether you're walking very uh, solidly. And um, the same with if you are um, skiing, if you have two skis or one ski, or snowboarding versus skis, that changes your perception of speed and, and, um, uh, and danger. And so these philosophers and cognitive scientists have um, described and written about these phenomena and how that affects how we think about um, uh, the design of tools and technology. And um, Andy Clark in particular has talked about the plasticity of the brain and how we're able to adapt um, as we grow older and change and how we use different tools and technologies. Given that is the case, that we are able to adapt and appropriate technologies and they become part of us, then we can think quite differently about how we should design these technologies and the interfaces between them to extend um, and uh, even amplify how we think and solve problems. Now, I want to just go back a bit um, in the history of cognitive science because it seems to be a um, a theme here to think a bit back about the, the theories in psychology and cognitive science. And one of the uh, papers I read in the late 60s that um, I um, it was a, kind of had a profound moment or an effect on me was a paper by Herb Simon and uh, um, Jill, Jill Larkin and Herb Simon. And it was called, Is a Picture Worth 10,000 Words? And they were very interested in why it is that we're able to make inferences from diagrams in ways which we find hard from equivalent um, sentences. And they were one of the first to try and model and explain the computation that takes place when we interact with external representations. And at the time, I found it was like, you know, wow, they really are thinking about what we do with um, out, the outside world there. And one of the things about diagrams is that it, it shows you spatially the relationships and the interdependencies between dimensions. It makes it really easy to read things off. Now, I'm, I'm not sure how 
uh, easy it is to read. It's a bit blurred, I'm afraid, but this is a, a diagram of uh, the royal family and who's married to whom and who's next in line of the throne and who's divorced. And if it wasn't quite so blurry, you could tell me by reading off there how many of the royal family have been divorced and who is the sixth next in line. <laughs> Unfortunately, because I took this off the internet um, without doing the usual things, it's a bit blurred. But the point here is that you could see just by... Uh, following through the, the dotted lines, those are the ones who are divorced, um, and then uh, the, the, the gold crown show with a number in it, who's the next in line. If I was to describe all of the royal family to you and then ask you who's the sixth in line of the throne, that would be much harder for you to make those inferences. And so there's something very uh, intuitive about the way in which diagrams work, and yet there are some awful diagrams out there. It doesn't mean that because um, diagrams can be better than... Uh, words that they are all um, designed to show those spatial relations. But anyway, um, I want you to just give you a go so that you can um, understand uh, the difference. So here, the triangle is to the right of the square. The square is to the right of the circle. I want you to say to me, what shape is in the middle? Square. 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 Okay, who said that first? That's your prize. You have to solve it. <laughs> How many of you found that quite hard? You had to close your eyes to think it through. Most of you. Okay, so you have to kind of do this, mentally place the objects side by side to work it out. And then you have to keep a partial solution if you won't do it. Whereas if I said, what shape's in the middle? You just read it off. It is just so straightforward. So um, that just kind of shows you uh, uh, the fundamental principle of how... Uh, these types of graphical representations work. And so, as I said, some diagrams are good and some are bad. This one, I think, is, is good because it makes it obvious where to draw conclusions. And it also allows you to use your finger to move up and down so that you can feel the steepness um, and, the, the, um, when, and you can see how to track um, the differences that, that happen um, in that particular graph. And at the time, um, I spent a lot of time thinking about what does this mean for uh, those of us who are moving into uh, interaction design. And um, I wrote a, a paper with uh, late Mike Scaife in 91, which now has over 850 um, citations. So we're very pleased that people have actually read this and then decided that it's worth um, citing. But we, put in, we tried to come up with some fundamental design principles to do with why it is that multimedia might be better than an animation, why it is that a diagram might be better than um, text, or, and why virtual reality might be better. Thinking about all of the different kinds of interactive um, uh, representations that are now possible um, uh, with um, computation. And so we came up with a number of um, principles, and I'm just going to mention a couple of them, and how they have influenced my thinking and others' design since. So one of these is this idea of computational offloading, which basically says how external representations vary um, the amount of cognitive effort required to do the same task. And I've given you a, a really simple example of that, which was with the diagram and the, the informationally equivalent um, text describing this, the triangle, the square, and the circle. And... Um, it's, what it is about using graphical representations is that it constrains and it enables you to see um, the interdependencies and the relationships in ways um, that makes it cognitively easier or harder to perform a certain task. So let's have a look at this um, diagram here. And we're all, many of us are interested in how we can design technologies to reduce uh, people's electricity or their energy um, consumption. And there are lots and lots of uh, technologies out there, smart meters and other kinds of um, <coughs> technologies that are intended to persuade people to change um, what they're doing. And the idea is that seeing a graph like this makes you think, wow, we're using this amount, perhaps we could reduce it. But also what I think is very effective with this is it shows you straight away where the peaks are. So it shows you how much electricity is used in the, at night and during the day and it, over a number of years. And you can see in January how it peaks um, because that's winter. But it changes over the years. So people are getting better insulation. Now have a look at this one. Anyone want to explain to me what that is trying to show? This is in LA. 
It's a bit blurred, um, but the idea is that you will click on certain aspects and it will show you uh, different types of dwellings and how much electricity they are using. It's much more complicated. You have to interact with it and um, it it's doesn't have that same um, easiness by which to compute or to read off um, what uh, certain um, households are using. So there are two examples of quite different ways of representing the same information, um, and one is much easier to read off. But what if we could take it one step further and put the graphical representation actually um, onto the street rather than it just being on a computer screen and so that it became embodied, embodied and embedded into the environment so that everyone could have a look at it to see how they were contributing to reducing the electricity. Um, and so that's what we did two or three years ago with Tidy Street. I don't know how any, any of you have saw the project. Tidy Street is just a few streets away. And um, we were trying to get the whole street to reduce its electricity. And we had a very simple web-based application where every day they would go down to the meter, read it, and then just type that in. And then we could average for all of those who were participating how much electricity um, they were using on average for the street. And then we got a graffiti artist to spray on the road what that average was relative to the rest of Brighton. And the idea was that they could see how well they were doing using social norm theory, whether they were above or below. And if you look at this picture here, you can see how you can walk along the street, you can even skateboard along the street, and you get a really different feel for how the electricity is changing over the days um, in terms of how much they're using or less they're using. And then on one day, they all got together and decided to try and get the line. As you can see, it's just um, wavering below. They wanted to get it over the double yellow lines, which meant that onto the pavement. <laughs> So to try and you know, to collectively think about how they might do that. It was very much a community-based project. Um, everyone got involved. Some people were unable to um, reduce their electricity, but others um, got really interested in raising their awareness of just how much they were doing and what they might cut back on. And it went viral. We got lots of other um, uh, cities um, getting in touch to say, can we um, try this out in our place? Because we were able to, over the period of 15, 15, uh, three weeks, reduce the electricity by 15%, which is quite something at that time. And we also got um, a filmmaker, Gary Huswit, who came over and made it as part of his documentary on, on Urbanised. And I'm just going to show you a couple of minutes um, to get, give you a sense of... Um, the, the way in which the graphical representation became a central part of the project. We were interested in doing a public display, so we decided that we would turn the street, essentially, into a big graph. On the street, we show how the average usage of the participants compares to the Brighton average. It's 500 feet long, we record it for three weeks, and each day we show how they compare. So if you're looking down the street, you can see how their electricity usage has changed over time. It's woken us up. I'm not very technological, is it? So I did my best, and I am try to unplug things and so on, but it has made us very conscious of what we, you know, what we use, what we waste. It wasn't really so much about the numbers as where your wiggly line was going in relation to the street's wiggly line. Seeing the information graphically really focused you into thinking about things that you leave on that you don't need to. Mine was quite high, so I needed to, in the community spirit, try and get that down rather than bring the street average out and above. Um, so I started changing the way I did things. One other piece of technology that we gave the participants was um, an appliance meter. I think that was really important for them because once they got an idea of how their overall electricity was changing, they then wanted to identify which particular appliances were, were using more electricity. We'd see just how greedy some of the devices we had in the house were. Halogen lighting, very, very greedy. Uh, television, not so bad. The kettle. You know, we have to ration the number of cups of tea that we have every day uh, because uh, it uses up so much electricity. But it does make you very aware of what you're using. 
everybody that walked by. You could see them examining the street art, trying to understand what it was. There was a lot of conversation that went on in the street. You know, when you met something, you were always talking about the project. When people were walking down on a Saturday, they wanted to talk about the project. So I think it genuinely raised the profile, having this thing in the road. So there's an example of computational offloading, where this thing in the road um, became very much a social and community um, artifact that everyone talked about and used um, to try and think, uh, increase their awareness of their usage of electricity and, and how they might change their behaviour. It's very different from some of the, uh, the types of graphs that, are being, um, that you get with smart meters or indeed some of the uh, personal informatics and, and uh, mm -hmm. the health devices that MC talked about, which they give you these bog standard graphs that appear as a mobile app. Very powerful embedding it in the street like that. It was, I should say, chalk that washed away. So don't go running up to Tidy Street because it's not there anymore. Um, so another design principle we talked about back in 91 was um, diner linking. And this is quite simple. It's thinking about, uh, because we can now do it with um, interactivity, you can change um, one representation co with another to show different levels of abstraction. So I'm going to give you an example of our first attempt at doing this and then a couple of projects where we've really taken it much further. So this was developed um, using uh, some very old... Um, software package uh, by Matt Davis, and I'm not sure if it's going to work, but let's see. And it's trying to show to kids how, how to construct a food web, and that's on the right, you can see this, and they have to work out which organisms go in which to show the energy flow. That's not right. And so here, what it's showing is uh, that the perch is um, below it, and over here we will show in the concrete that what happens if that was the case. Um, so, something like that shows a very concretely, in a simulation, what would happen if that was the case. And the kids learn very quickly um, to, to get it the right way round, but it's usually a cause of confusion. And so there is an example of diner linking where you have this um, formalism over here you have to learn, and you link it with changes that are happening in the simulation. Um, and so that was our first attempt. We then went into the world of commerce, um, that was in education, to think how we could use this principle of diner linking to try and um, uh, improve two-way, um, two-party transactions. I don't know how many of you uh, um, use travel agents anymore, um, but this, um, a few years ago, people who went into this travel agent and said, I want to go for a round-the-world trip. Um, this is how much of my budget, can you help me? It's a very complex thing to build up. Um, where you're, uh, all the hotels you might stay in the, the, and the other products, especially if it's for a year. And so um, and they are still very much uh, very popular um, products, um, especially for amongst those who are retiring, who've got some money to spend. And so what we did was we looked at the current way in which when someone goes into a, a travel agent, what happens? You have the uh, consultant sitting there uh, looking at their computer and the customer saying, I'd like to do something. And so here's a video... Um, showing what typically happens. So we found that happened often that people go in and they just couldn't get the information they wanted. There was a mismatch. So we spent a lot of time trying to think how we could improve it such that that communication could be enhanced so that the customer could actually um, spend more time looking at the representations um, and be involved in the building up of that product. At the time, we were doing some innovative research into large uh, displays. We thought, let's do a, a tabletop display. This is before the Surface came out. And so we spent a lot of time building our own. But what we found is the bigger the table got, the worse it was for the, the collaboration because things would just, as you well know, would just disappear. You couldn't find that document. It was hidden under somewhere and you'd be going like this and not being able to find it. And so we were getting very frustrated about, well, perhaps the tabletop isn't the right answer. And then we had one of those aha moments. Um, and... Um, what we realised was that why are we using just one large display, just because it's the cool technology at the moment? Why don't we Dynalink 
a number of displays. And so this was our design concept, um, which was to have multiple displays which are linked to each other. And that what happened in this display, you could see the effects on another one. Um, quite a simple idea, but it really um, changed our way of thinking um, about how to uh, develop interactive software for this um, particular setting. And so that's our design concept. This is the, the, uh, the prototype that we built, where uh, we just embedded two uh, screens um, into a tabletop and then had a third one at the back. We spent a lot of time thinking, how many? Should we have four? Should we have five? Should we have two? We ended up with this lovely idea of a triangle. And the way in which it works is there was an interactive map planner on the left where you would uh, create your trip around Australia. And then when you wanted to find out information about hotels, it would automatically pop up, pop up contextualised hotel information or tours that was relevant to what was happening. And then on the right, we had some visualisations which showed how much it was costing as you were building up your product, plus the itinerary. And so both the customer and the... Uh, um, the tour guide um, knew, uh, were able to build up and knew where to look, where the information was. So here you can just see on the, one, the left the interactive planning tool as we're selecting for a hotel, up pops um, uh, a relevant hotel that they might be interested in and then the price gets added over there. So you don't have to keep asking um, how much will that cost or will that go over my budget. It's quite subtle the way in which that information was provided. And um, at the time, the travel company we were working with were really pleased with this um, prototype. We put it into their trade show, and they uh, were uh, the talk of the trade show. Everyone came over. So here's an example of um, it being used. And you can see how they're sitting side by side, rather than one being on the other side of the desk, and that they know uh, where to guide their attention, which display to look at. Um, and I'll just briefly show a bit of, here's an um, example of a very happy customer, and it changes completely the dynamics between those two. Okay, so you can see that there's a very different um, engagement and interaction between them and that the customer is very much driving uh, um, the way in which that product was being developed. So quite a contrast um, through using this way of linking di uh, multiple displays and driving um, their attention. We've used this approach in a number of uh, other um, prototypes we've built, but one I want to just quickly show you now is a student of mine, Stefan Kreitmeier, has been thinking about how we could change the way in which we do training and education in whole classrooms, such that instead of everyone having their own uh, tablet and working on it by themselves, you get the whole classroom um, engaged in very um, you know, exciting and um, fun ways, but also that they're learning, they're putting into practice the theory. And he developed... Um, um, uh, an application called Four Decades, and this was intended for climate leaders, people who run banks and uh, the co-op and all of these places who spend thousands and thousands of pounds to go on a five-day course to learn about sustainability and the climate. And they put through hours and hours of lectures on, on the various um, simulations and the uh, equations you can use to predict the future. And what um, Stefan did um, was to think about how you could give... Um, develop a simulation that engaged the whole classroom and to put this theory into practice. Using that principle of dyna linking, where you're linking what happens on one display with what happens on a public display. And I'll, use, I'll play the video because it's very clear as to how that works. Imagine you're in a classroom just after a lecture on global warming. To put theory into practice, the whole group are now playing a simulation where groups pretend to be governments on two competing planets. They use simple tablet interfaces to make climate decisions together. And those decisions are then projected onto public displays in real time. There is one public display for each team, each team being one planet. This way the whole room can see what each team is doing. All the displays and tablets are connected into one big simulation. This is different from individual iPad games. Here, everyone is collaborating trying to figure out clever strategies. Their goal is to make their planet more sustainable than the other team's planet. Here you can see some people spying on the other team. 
This is a fun way to apply theory in practice, whether it's climate or other topics, in school or in professional training. Using an ecology of shared devices, we can get a whole room to discuss together, with the teacher being able to integrate those discussions into their lectures immediately by looking at the public displays. This is not new technology, but rather using the technology we already have at schools to encourage active discussion. So the simulation was really simple. There were very little you could actually do. But what it did was it encouraged rich um, interaction and discussion around it, externalizing it, getting all of the, uh, the class um, engaged. And it was so successful that um, the, uh, the training company keep asking us to come back and run it. But also we've, we've developed it um, for applications in schools um, for financial management. So just to um, kind of summarize that point, I think rather than always thinking about designing apps for one person to run on their phone or to run on their tablet, that we, can, we now have uh, ways of thinking about using shared devices um, and public displays where what happens on one can be dynamically linked to, to another. And you can get um, uh, what you, you've been doing, comparing it to what another team is, and it gets the attention to follow through um, in a way that makes sense and is meaningful. And what our job is to think about how we can orchestrate collaborative activities in, in this engaging way. Okay, I'm just going to finish um, uh, my talk by talking a bit more about embodiment. That was um, uh, how we might use DynaLinking. But what other ways can we think about design when we're out of our minds? And so... Um, Following on from uh, the likes of Andy Clark and uh, um, David Kirsch, thinking about embodiment, very much about thinking through our bodies, the way in which we gesture, we walk around, we lie under, we hold, we wear. So on the left here is Cloudgate. How many of you have been to Chicago, to the Millennium Park, and have seen this? It's a, it's a very lovely <coughs> silver bean uh, designed by Anish Kapoor. And what people do is they poke it, and then they lie on the floor like this. And they look up at it. And you get a very different perspective if you're lying down. I recommend lying down sometimes if you need to think about creatively. I think that's my little bit there. Um, and you've all probably heard about Jeff Hawkins, who uh, was, uh, came up with the, the idea of the Palm Pilot. He wants to know whether people, how it would feel if you had um, a mobile device um, in your pocket. So he just... Um, knocked together a piece of wood and put it into his pocket and carried it around for several months to think how it would feel. Now we take it for granted, but at the time, he thought it was really important not just to do a nice CAD diagram thinking about how it might look, but how it might feel and what it might be like to take it out. And that was a really important part of the prototyping, was to be able to do that kind of embodied interaction. Um, so there are a number of design principles that are coming out um, as well from... Uh, embodiment, just as there were from external cognition. And I've talked a bit at the very beginning about this idea of cognitive tracing, where we reorder things to, in order to play out um, or to, um, to think ahead before we commit to a particular move. And that's kind of a, you know, it seems to be a very important design principle that we might try and use. There's another one that David Kirsch has been talking about called projecting. And this idea is how we project our imagination out there in order to, to think creatively. And if any of you um, have a chance to go up to London, there's a great exhibition on at the mo moment with Wayne McGregor and Random Dance, who he's been working with for a few years. And they have, it's an exhibition that's at the Wellcome Trust called Thinking With Our Bodies. And David's been very much involved in trying to explain some of the cognitive principles. And this one, project, projecting, I'll just, it's about how you attach a mental image to a structure. And I'm going to give you um, an example of one of his uh, video clips of a dancer. The dancer is Noah uh, Gelber, who's part of Bill Forsythe's um, group. And the dancer's trying to come up with a new uh, dance. And the way in which he does it is to um, uh, think about various pieces of furniture um, and rip bits of it apart. So I'll just play the video and you can get a sense.
so the, the white animation that was, that's been superimposed, but that's what he's thinking when he's trying to create this dance. Eventually, he, when, once he's satisfied with it, he'll memorise it and he may not think about those objects in a way in which we might have an imaginary friend. We can imagine that person, and then later on in life we still talk to ourselves, but we don't have that imaginary friend. But this way of projecting out there helps in the creative process, thinking of, of a quite different um, uh, dance. So, um, just to uh, kind of summarise here, is how can we couple our bodies, technologies and everyday objects in the environment to provide new opportunities for thinking, control and um, creativity? And I think this is really important as we move into this new era of the Internet of Things. In The Economist, uh, a few days ago, there was an article which said over 70% of companies are now doing something with the Internet of Things. When probed a bit, most people are just doing... Uh, things being two devices where you pass information from one device to another using Bluetooth or something. And I think that it's very limited currently the way in which we are thinking of the Internet of Things. And we could actually broaden out much more if we started to think more about how we move around in the world and how we use objects rather than it just being about how we pass information between these devices. Um, any of you got a happy fork yet? The idea of the happy fork, um, and I think it's just out now, is that it will vibrate um, if you're eating too fast. And the idea is that it will, that vibration will slow you down and you will eat less. And this probably is uh, something that MC should investigate as to whether that kind of embodiment, that it becomes part of you, and you couldn't bear the idea that your arm would be shaking when you eat, um, might actually help you reduce um, your food. It might just increase the awareness enough for you to think. Um, big data is another huge topic uh, that uh, we um, are all talking about. This is a photo I take, took at Kai earlier this year, which is Blomberg's very proud of their, the way in which they visualise all of their financial data and the tools that uh, they make available. Uh, how do the analysts use this? Well, there's a tiny window which they do most of their work, but they have all of this around them in case there are certain things that might happen and it catches them in their peripheral vision. But there are other ways in which we might think about big data. And there's the lovely um, dashboards uh, that are everywhere. Everyone's talking about dashboards. This one I came across by Jira, and they say you can see at a glance things like the pulse on your project, the health of your project. But is that really what you want to do? Supposing you, if you see it that it's unhealthy, what do you do next? And wouldn't it be great if we had some tools that could help us to probe and to, and to think about things? So an idea might be that we have data balls. So the flexible Olio um, display that everyone's getting excited with, the curvy tellies, why not put them onto balls and that we could move, then have data projected onto these and we could move these balls around a bit like Scrabble so that you could start to think about that, the, the relationship or the inter interdependence between that dimension and that one and start doing some really interesting things with data rather than just looking at, the, at a glance the pulse of, of um, your company. What about touching data? This is Rachel Whiteread. You could walk around it. You could look up at it. You get a very different way of understanding and perceiving and, and thinking about data. And how about data totems? Where it's public, you have a big thing. This is in uh, Barcelona and this is in Cape Town. It projects something about your company, the health or the pulse of it, so that everyone can see, a bit like Tidy Street. Do I have two more minutes? Okay. The last thing I want to show you is a project that's um, get, get, um, running in my department as part of a... We are funded by Intel to look at sustainable and connected cities. My building is dreadful. It is... Um, Lots of corridors like this, dark and gloomy. You never see anyone on the different floors. No one ever talks to each other apart from the group they work with. We wanted to open up the building, get people to talk to each other a bit more um, and just maybe, you know, find out that that person there is doing some really exciting research. And what we did was something really simple. We didn't come up with a mobile app. We designed um, what we're calling the squeezy ball, which was that on each floor, as you come in, we put a series of coloured mood balls that you can squeeze depending on the mood you're feeling. Are you having a yellow afternoon or a green afternoon or a purple afternoon? And it was a really simple idea is to, make, um, to get people more connected by getting them to think about their mood at that moment and to talk about it. 
So there are two parts, the squeezing of the ball and then the public display. And we found that, um, yes, it has increased uh, the uh, social connectedness in that people start to talk to each other. There are subversive people who will keep pressing to try and get the whole floor to be yellow or to be blue. There are those who only do it when no one else is looking. But we find that when people go out for a cigarette or um, they will actually start talking about this project for better or worse. But it's opening up a very different way um, of thinking about how we can use technology. So just to, my summary is dare to think differently. And that instead of trying to automate or make more efficient, we should be thinking about how to design, to amplify, to extend, and embody. And that we should be encouraging different kinds of activities like exploring, projecting, linking, connecting, following, and comparing. And then lastly, think about new input outputs. Sorry I went over time, but thank you very much. Thank you.